Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Chicago-based jazz pianist, composer, band leader, and teacher, Dr. Dave Flippo. This native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the leader and founder of Planet Flippo opened up about his debut 2021 CD, Dedications from Jazz from Planet Flippo otherworldly jazz. After completing his doctorate and master's degrees, he moved to his current home of Chicago. Along with being a musician, he is a professor teaching the next generation of jazz cats and joyous story. Thanks for taking a minute out, man. Sure, I listen to some of the interviews and then I get some ideas of you know, where, where you're coming from and, and I enjoyed listening to some of the people. Oh, cool, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate it. Your latest album, kind of this interplanetary Planet Flippo, very cool vibe going on here. I want to know, <laughs> it's coming out during a very strange interplanetary time on Earth. What Did you have any thoughts on this coming out kind of on the tail end of COVID and, you know, just the way things have been over the last year? Well, I, I did, you know, I did wonder about what time to have the release, and I kind of tried to time it now when things are coming out a little bit more. Uh, we're going to be able to play a CD release party in a in a, uh, a place in, in near where I live, you know, in Chicago. That it has an open door, but it also has an open room. It's a brewery, you know, and just the idea of having a, a real CD release party instead of a Zoom one is, is kind of a cool thing. But you know, Planet Flippo, that's basically my brain. It's, <laughs> it's you know where where my creative world is. That's just kind of a joke on that. That my brain is its own little planet. I guess that's the good thing, you know, as I've talked to musicians over this last year, there's been an evolution of what I'm curious about and how the interplay is working. And I think we're at an advantageous time right now where you're actually talking about live and in person. So that have you thought about that being a very good, fortunate time right now so that you can kind of have this live element to get this album out to the people's hands? Yeah, I mean, that's one of those things about, you know, when somebody uh, throws some uh, iTunes on at a wedding or something, I mean, the idea of having a band for any kind of, or even in a club, whereas interaction, the bodies are in the room and you're looking at each other and maybe talking. I mean, it's like a whole different kind of a thing between the bodies, you know. But we we did do lawn concerts in uh, the summer and in the fall in my front yard, which were really fun. And people did come and they spaced out in their chairs with their masks on and and that was fun. You know, I guess that's the thing about this year. You know, wh- what did you learn about yourself over this quarantine time and just slowing everything down that maybe you didn't realize before that's going to make you stronger as you do hit the stage again? It was definitely a time of, you know, I, my wife and, and I both, uh, we, we live at home. My kids are growing up now. So it's basically us both working at home. I teach at two colleges. I was doing Zoom classes. She's working uh, in public relations and stuff and communications from her little office. And it was really a time for me personally, just for us to be together and, you know, get to go take a walk at lunch and eat more meals together. And it was really, a, a, you know, like, like, you know, the quarantine idea, like it's not too many other people are involved in your life. So that was kind of a strange thing. It's just a change of balance, you know. So how do you see the world of jazz, live music, probably more specifically jazz, just because it's a little bit, I mean, that's the realm we're talking about, but it's definitely a, a realm that um, it, it's not the most lucrative in the world of music. But how do you see the jazz community emerging stronger after this pandemic? Um, I think people miss miss music and miss um, the interaction. They're going to hopefully come out and, you know, see, and there's probably going to be more, opportunities to do outdoor things and, you know, more creative. I think people got pretty creative and there'll, there'll be more creative um, ways of playing and getting people to listen. Uh, like these things about playing at somebody's house or, you know, I've heard about that. I haven't done that. You've had quite a path. You originally are from Pittsburgh. You went to the University of Michigan. You're in Chicago now. Let's start off with growing up in Pittsburgh. How did the seeds of jazz, the the, the love of jazz come into your life? Well, it's funny. I'm, I'm a classical nerd. You know, I grew up, I started playing the piano when I was four by ear, you know, and then, then I, um, and I was basically took class, classical piano lessons and learned to play Billy Joel. And, and I didn't do too much jazz, but I was in the jazz band in high school. I went to college and, and, and I, I never really studied jazz too much. I learned about chords, 
And I went to Eastman School for my master's, and they have an amazing jazz program there. I ignored it, and I was trying to be Beethoven, you know, and write concert pieces. But then as soon as I got out of, I sent my doctorate at the University of Michigan, I said, I'm going to go to Chicago and do jazz. Because <laughs> <laughs> I started studying jazz with this guy, uh, Alan Swain, and I would take the train from Ann Arbor to um, Chicago, to Evanston, actually, just five hours on Saturday, and then I would take it back. <laughs> so uh, I did that like every other week for a while, and I learned, actually learned jazz in theory. And then when I moved there, then I, uh, you know, started building a jazz career. The one thing I noticed about this album, too, before we depart from there, uh, you know, you have Karma Police and you have some some uh, interesting tunes on here. What do you want the listener to get from this artistic expression you put out? I like music that kind of, like, stretches the mind a little bit. That's why I like counterpoint so much, but I don't do I haven't had a chance to do as much counterpoint as I like. But... Music that stretches the mind and adds some new colors or um, makes you think of things a little differently, you know, I think music should help you grow. Like, Third Eye Open is one of, I think, one of my better pieces I've written, and I was really trying to create this thing in the middle of it where it all, like, the music gets sick. It's like a sickness of the soul, and you're, you're like, struggling to keep going, and then you climb out of it, and then you reach your goal, and there's a big moment where you reach a goal, and that, and... You know, so telling a story like that, a kind of a spiritual story, I guess. How did your path, well, well, actually, before we get to Chicago, tell me what was the first live jazz show you saw that really made you think, man, that's spectacular, I'd love to do that. I, I know in high school we had Maynard Ferguson come to our our, uh, our place and he played, and, and, you know, that's not really quite up the same style, but it still was impressive, and actually we had some master classes with some of the people in it about improvising. So that's kind of the first thing I first one of the first live ones I saw, but you know when I went to school I started seeing guys playing in clubs, but I just don't remember who they were. Any albums, any musicians you were listening to growing up that really kind of swayed the way that you, you know, wanted to play or the way that you love jazz music? Uh, I always loved Miles Davis, and and I just love watching him go through these different periods, and I really appreciate. I really you know, think that's an amazing thing for an artist to be able to do the change like a chameleon and like this is blue is crazy, but so is like, you know, just stuff in the fifties and and I love Tutu and you know, I just take change into the fusion stuff and I love that music too. Uh, Bill Evans as a pianist, I like Bill Evans a lot because he's kind of like I, I love Bach like more than anything and he's he's kind of a little Bachy the way he approaches improvising. So how did you get Chicago? I, I absolutely love that town. It has, I have a very soft spot for it. How did you end up in Chicago and kind of get your your tent poles in the ground, so to speak? You know, I'm from Pittsburgh, which is kind of like they call it the gateway to the the West, I guess, or something. It's kind of a Midwestern city. It has a little bit of a Midwestern vibe to it, which is more laid back, you know, um, than New York. And I, so when I finished, I thought, do I, do I go to New York, Chicago, or L.A. to try to, like, throw myself into the fire, and I had heard that you can start working faster in Chicago than in New York. You probably have to wait tables for two years or something, um, but I was also studying with this guy in Chicago, so I, I got drawn to there mainly because it's Midwestern. You know, I kind of, you know, it, it just seemed like the right logical place for me to go, and when I got there, you know, it was, it was pretty bleak. You know, I still didn't know how to play piano yet, and I, um, um, you know, it's taking lessons, and it was like concentrated lessons to try to learn jazz quickly. You learn this, this stride style, which I had to be able to do for solo piano. And I was, you know, working at a liquor store, working at a Kinko's, and, and I had like three students at this uh, Swain Studios. So I had a studio, and it started to build, and I started to teach in some colleges. Um, and then eventually, you know, it's it's not, it's not that, that big of a uh, career that I have or income that I have, but at least it is all music now. So. That's good. Yeah. What have you learned over the years playing with veteran musicians that has in turn helped you as a teacher teach those that want to be professional musicians? Well, it's a tough business. And, you know, and I, I, I get students that are that want to be music majors and they haven't even learned their instrument yet. And, and sometimes you, you have to tell them, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of competition out there. I mean, that. I'm not, I, I usually am very positive and, you know, let people have their dreams, but, um, 
you know, some people come into a, a music school with some really developed chops, and they're ready to to start, you know, moving up and really gaining a lot of, uh, uh, you know, gaining a lot of skills and talent and everything. And uh, other people are just starting to square one, and that's tough when you. Uh, and I'm, I'm in the community colleges, and sometimes it's just somebody says, "I want to do this. I'm going to major in this," and because I love it, and it's it's a it's a really tough road that not not a lot of people can do. You know, something about the guys that I yeah. play with. You know. Uh, I wanted to say something about the, the, the guys I play with are all um, amazing musicians, and they they taught me a lot. And uh, you know, I have Dan Hessler on saxophone, and Heath Chapel on drums, and Don DeSanto on bass, and Aris is on Aris Biscus on percussion, who I wrote one of the songs for. Um, when we do these recording sessions and rehearsals, they all we bounce ideas back and forth, and they make suggestions, and we, you know, the music kind of morphs in the, the rehearsals into the form that you hear on the album. And so that's like a big part of the process uh, in, in our music making. What do you like the best about being a professional musician? Every day you wake up, you have the opportunity to create music, and uh, clearly with your new album, what is it that you enjoy the most about the process? The thing I'm, I like the most is, is composing, but I hardly get to do it because I'm, you know, I have this to-do list of all these other things to do, and, and I like to practice, too, and I hardly do that. I'm being honest with you here. Uh, I, that, that's I, I really do enjoy those two things, and but it is really fun to you know as a, to slowly take the pieces that do get written and put them and you know, get them down on on a desk and and get them out. I just wish um, uh, you know that it was a little bit different of a balance where I would compose more regularly, uh, but that's my own issue. <laughs> I don't know if that's if that a good answer or not. Yeah, no, it's great. Uh, so you may have already answered this one. I know you have mentioned having a fond place in your heart for Miles Davis, but if you could get into a jazz DeLorean and take off and go anywhere and see anybody, who would you want to see live in the history of jazz? And maybe who would you want to talk to afterwards? I don't know if I could get to talk to Miles Davis or how much he would say to you. He'd probably just mumble a couple of words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he doesn't seem like one of those like expressive, fuzzy guys. Like, oh, it's so nice to talk to you, Dave. I, I, Bill Evans, I like Bill Evans. I mean, there's, there's some really great you know, people. Um, you know, Coltrane, and uh, that's, a, that's another, like, um, his mind, you know. His, I like to see what's behind his mind with, with the way he makes all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know, as we all start getting to the point where we're getting back to live music, you're getting on the stage and we're getting back into the crowd. What do you hope we all realize about the power of live music that we've been away from for so long? That there is, that it, it, it creates a kind of a magical connection between bodies, you know, it's like people are on the stage and they're giving you something and, and you're in the same room together and there's a connection, like an invisible connection that reaches out between everybody in the audience if they let, them, if they let themselves feel it. And that's much different than just listening to something on, a, on an album. And there's also a personal thing that they're actually, musicians on the stage are giving something to you personally, and then the people in the audience are giving something to the musicians because they're, you know, there's a, cir a circle that's created. Why do you love jazz? Uh, I like the freedom of it. Um, I, I like the fact that you can, like, play something differently every time, and it's and it um, reacts to your mood and your whims whimsy, you know. Half the time when I'm, I'll be honest again, half the time when I'm, because I don't practice as much as I like to, half the time when I'm doing a solo, I don't quite get the lick that I want, and I get another one, and then it, and that changes everything where I'm going, and then I, you know, I, I'm like riding a bareback horse, you know, and it's like, and, and I don't even know where the solo's going half the time, but it's, that's part of the fun. Um, and then sometimes I do get solos out, and I, and I actually play all the licks that I'm hearing in my head. Um, but sometimes, uh, you know, it's just, it's like a, an adventure just to play the solo, and I don't even know what's going to happen. So everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, your students, but ultimately you're the one that's living your life. Who do you think you are? I'm a, I'm a person with a bunch of different, um, different uh, you know, uh, parts, um, like most people are. Like so most people are, you know, schizophrenic in that way. You know, you know my husband, I have my great kids, I have a family. I like to do, ride my bike. I like to do carpentry. And, you know, uh, I like to do gigs. And I love music. You know, music has a kind of a hierarchy, too. Like, I, I mainly see myself as a composer and a pianist and a second. And a band leader is, is in there. And, 
what else is in there? Oh, teacher, yeah. The teacher was something I didn't really plan on doing that I kind of evolved into doing. I wasn't trained for it, really. But all those things make up, you know, it's like a big tapestry. And um, so it isn't really a one-word answer. <laughs> no, it's never. No. Yeah, there's a lot going on, man. Hey, Dave, thank you for taking some time out to talk about the new album. Good luck with it. Good luck with the return to the stage and send my best to Chicago. Thanks. Well, thanks for talking with me, and I really appreciate what your page does for people like me and other musicians. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Pittsburgh, Chicago, Kansas City, and spots all over the world. Giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Dave for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.